Hi, so um, I graduated from Yale in 1996. I was a double geek in math and physics. And what I want to do today is to talk about work I've been doing with students over the years. At least one student here today is responsible for some of the work. Another student who uh, is visiting grad schools could not be here today. What I love about these problems is how accessible they are. And so you do not need advanced mathematics. It sometimes helps to know advanced mathematics, but it's not necessary. And so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about undergraduate research. Everybody who is here today will be admitted into a summer REU. I will make sure of it. And I'll talk a little bit about exactly what conditions and strings are on that in a moment. So just you know, a couple of ideas. You know, what is an REU in case you haven't heard about it? It's a research experience for undergraduates. And so a lot of it is learning you know, what questions to ask. That's actually more important than having math skills, especially in the era of you know, ChatGTP and all these online programs now that can do you know, proofs. So much of it comes down to finding a good question to ask. And once you have a good question to ask, we're all good trained monkeys and we know how to do things. I could have been accused of plagiarizing when I was a grad student because I wrote notes on something on Benford's Law and Fibonacci numbers. And turns out it was published in the Fibonacci Quarterly the year I was born. And I was relating the story to somebody about a year ago. He goes, I wrote that paper. He goes, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I had never read it. But it's just as soon as you ask the question, it's natural how you attack this. So a lot of it is you need to explore. You know, this is the advantage of being at a liberal arts college where you see lots of different things and you can try to make connections between the different fields. You really have to utilize what are your skills, what distinguishes you from the other people who are looking at you. And so again, a lot of it is building on what you know and can learn. And so you don't need to know everything, but you need to be able to learn some things quickly or you need to work with people who have those skills. You have to find what's gonna be interesting because at the end of the day, who's gonna care? Who's gonna fund it? Who's gonna be excited about this? And so I have a lot of students who are fascinated about certain areas of mathematics that very few people care about nowadays. And it's always, do you follow your passion or do you consider the fact that, eh. uh, the next thing is how are you going to work? So if you're going to do an REU program, you're gonna be working in a group with other people. Can you work well with others? Can you come up with a work habit that will fit with them, with your professor and all that stuff? And so again, I don't wanna be you know, spending too much time on this. I'm happy to chat more over dinner, but a lot of it is asking interesting questions, looking for connections in different areas. Uh, this is being recorded. Do not share this with you know, a certain professor. But um, I ended up writing at least as many papers with marketing professors when I was in grad school as one of their students because I knew mathematics. And so when they found out that one of their students was dating a mathematician, it's like, oh, can we talk to him? And I was able to apply number theory and combinatorics into some very strange settings in marketing where it was just not things they knew of. So this leads very naturally to one of my favorite quotes of all time. There's many different variants. I like the last because it's the shortest and most concise. If all you have is a hammer, pretty soon everything looks like a nail. There's a lot of ways to look at this. One of the ways is no matter what you're given, you find a way to work this into your area of expertise. Does anybody know what's happening in November, 2024 in this country? The election. Has anybody ever listened to a presidential debate? It doesn't really matter which candidate or what question. They have a specific spiel that they want to get to. And whatever you ask them, it's just they meander and get to, this is the prepared spiel I want to. And depending on how well they do, it can somewhat even connect to the question. This is one way to look at the quote. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a hammer. You find a way to bring it to your area of expertise. The other way, and this is what has led to a successful career for me, I've published papers in accounting, computer science, economics, geophysics, statistics, you know, the list goes on and on and on, marketing, so many different areas, is you go to the land of the screwdriver. If they could have solved the problem with the screwdriver, they would have, they're smart people. No offense, I love you all, you're, I love Yale, I love my colleagues here. You're not gonna beat Gauss. You're not gonna beat oil if you go head to head on them. I remember uh, my freshman year, my study group had a very, alarming vote. Who would you rather have in the study group, me or Euler? And I lost to Euler. And I said, you know, Euler's dead. They go, yeah, but it would really be inspirational to have the body of Euler in the room. <laughs> like, yeah, I can kind of, yeah, okay. So you know, if you try to go head to head against Gauss, you know, no offense, Gauss is going to beat you. But if you can take techniques, and please come in, come in, grab pizza. Uh, if you could, there's pizza in the front row. Uh, if you can take techniques in one area and transfer them to another, you have a chance of making some incredible advances. And so that's really what I want you to get out of this is learn how to use different 
techniques in different areas. All right, so I'm gonna start off with the game. So I mentioned later in the day you can win $500. Today you can win $20 if you can beat me in this game. It's the I Love Rectangles game, okay? And here is how it works. You start off with infinitely many pieces, a one by one, a two by two, a three by three, a four by four, a five by five. I wasn't sure how big the screens were at Yale, so I stopped here at uh, five by five. So you have one of each square, and the only shape we will accept is a rectangle. So you have to put the pieces down on the board flat one at a time, and at every moment, the shape that you have on the board must be a rectangle, okay? So for instance, if I put down the three by three, I have made a rectangle because a square is a rectangle, okay? If you can put down two pieces legally, you can't put one piece on top of another. If you can put down two pieces such that you have a rectangle at every moment, I will give you 20 bucks. Is there anybody who thinks they can do this? I will make sure I actually have twenty dollars. Should yes, yes, I have twenty dollars on. Canadian money is how many can you put down? One at a time. So if you can put down two, I'll give you twenty Canadian. It's expensive to drive down here. You're not covering my expenses, and I'm paying for the ice cream later. Can can you do it? I give you like n of these squares. I give you infinitely many, one of each. Yeah. You have one one by one, one two by two, one three by three, one four by four. Okay, so why can't you do it? I mean, in my day, your students were so much better. <laughs> why can't you do it? Because the no two uh, squares have the same side length. Good. So you're always gonna Good. So once you put down an n by n, if you want to keep it as a rectangle, you would have to put down another n by n. So this game is extremely boring. You know, I'm reading a book right now on game theory by uh, you know, a really interesting character. Right now I'm reading about John von Neumann and everything. This would be very boring. So let's make the game more interesting. I obviously have to give you additional pieces. What is the cheapest thing I can do to give you a chance? The cheapest piece. A one by one. So I will give you another one by one. So now it's interesting seeing the delay from when I toggle here to there to there. So now you have two one by ones. Can anybody tell me how, oh, by the way, the $20 is off the table. Yeah, yeah. Can anybody tell me what you can do now? Okay, so you put you also one at a time. So take the two one by ones and put them together, right? You clearly have to do that because if you don't start off using the two one by ones, you're just using the pieces from a moment ago and we know we can't do that. So you know you have to start like this. Excellent. Now, what do I do next? Somebody else. Okay, where do I put it? How many choices do I have? And what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? Thank you. Yes, let's put it below. Excellent. Yes. So we'll put it below. Good choice. Now, what do we do? Yes. And should we put it to the left or should we put it to the left? Should we put it? Thank you. So we'll put it to the left. So clearly what we do is we just keep putting the pieces now we put down the four by four by induction, right? Mm -hmm. No, what do we put down next? Five by five, right? Does anybody recognize this? Yes, it is the Fibonacci sequence, right? I'm sorry? Okay, good, so we have the Fibonacci sequence. So there's a lot of wonderful properties. So this is the Fibonacci spiral. So my daughter and I made this you know, many years ago out of fuse beads. And so this was the original one. We then made a slightly larger 55 by 55. And one of the things you learn as a father is it's extremely hard to say no to children. And so I was somehow talked up to going a little bit larger. And so we made up to the 144. So this is two, I'm sorry, 33,552 fuse beads. Now you'll notice that there's a beautiful spiral going on here. There's a web link, it's very hard to see, to a wonderful YouTube video with the mandatory cheesy music you know, going on as it explores the Fibonacci numbers. They have a tremendous number of wonderful, interesting properties. Um, I thought I would just show one property right now to just illustrate the powers of looking at things the right way. Can anybody tell me the area of this rectangle? 
or at least give me a math computation to do to get the area. I have the two biggest side lengths and multiply by the biggest. Good. So basically it's 55 plus 34 is gonna be the length. 55 is gonna be the width, we multiply them. Excellent. Can you give me another way to find the area of this rectangle? Yes. Sum of all the little squares. So this is a geometric proof that the sum of the squares of the first n Fibonacci's is the nth times the n plus first. You can prove this by induction. There's lots of ways you can prove this, but it's nice that you're able to get a geometric proof from this. So this is meant to show you the power of different perspectives. Depending on how you look at things, you often see different connections. Later in the talk, I'm gonna show you a very painful proof of a beautiful result, but that painful proof leads to a lot of other wonderful things. So the prerequisites for this talk, um, it's good if people have seen a little bit of probability. So X is a random variable. It's non-negative, it integrates to one. The probability X takes on a value between A and B is just the area under the curve. If you have taken a calculus class on integration, and your professor did not mention probabilities, it is actually a crime and you can get the professor in trouble. You know, this is one of the biggest reasons why we care about finding areas under curves. It gives us probabilities. Only once in my life has someone come up to me on the street and asked me to calculate an area under a curve. And this was in Berkeley, California where you meet some interesting characters. Mm -hmm. right? Probabilities I'm asked all the time. I've done a lot of major league baseball lawsuits and other lawsuits with students. I'm happy to talk about those over ice cream afterwards, where we've had to do calculations like this to find probabilities. The mean is the average value. It's the integral of X times the density. The variance is how spread out things are. And you know, the Gaussian is one of the most common. The Gaussian, the bell curve, the normal. Whenever you have this many names, it's almost surely something important. Uh, it's just a uh, extremely common distribution that occurs in many places. Okay. The basic combinatorics we need is n factorial is the number of ways to order n people when order matters. n choose k is the number of ways to choose k people from n when order doesn't matter. And then Stirling's formula, how many of you have seen Stirling's formula? Okay, so a good number, but not ever. It's a great way to estimate the size of n factorial. When n is very large, n factorial is approximately n to the n e to the minus n square root of two pi n. Um, if you've taken a class with me or done some research with me, whenever you see a product, what should you do? Take the logs. Thank you. I, so whenever you have a product, you should take the logs. When you have n factorial, you take the log of n factorial. That's the sum of log k. k goes from 1 to n. You can approximate that sum with an integral, and then that's going to give you a poor mathematician's version of Stirling's formula by using the integral test from Calc. Okay, you can then do a little bit better. There's, or, there's lots of things you can do, but Stirling's formula says n factorial is about this size. If you know the central limit theorem, how many of you know the central limit theorem? You can actually get Stirling's formula from the central limit theorem. What distribution do I use? Anybody remember? Um, you might be able to do it from the binomial. That's not the one I normally use. It's Poisson, Poisson. So if you use Poisson because the sum of Poisson is, Poisson plus Poisson is Poisson, I believe, right? So the sum of two Poissons is a Poisson. And that means you actually know the density for the sum explicitly. You can actually get Stirling's formula popping out from that. Okay, these are the prereqs we need. So the Fibonacci numbers, um, I'm defining them as one, two, three, five, eight. Does anybody have any concerns about my definition? Well, the first one, we have one. Yes. F0. I, I'm skipping F0 and I'm skipping the first one. And the reason I'm skipping them is because this way I have the beautiful theorem due to Zeckendorf that every integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. If I have two ones, I am not gonna have uniqueness. If I have a zero, I'm not gonna have uniqueness. So you know, choosing a number completely not at random, let's choose 51. And then there is a wonderful mindset, algorithm that works in many cases to solve problems. It's not necessarily the fastest, but it's a really good algorithm. It's the greedy algorithm. At every moment in time, you do what's best. <clears throat> you know, If you're trying to maximize your happiness in life, should you maximize your happiness locally at every instant? <laughs> if that is the case, I am so glad you chose to come to my talk. <laughs> So obviously, if you're trying to maximize lifetime happiness, it might be worth studying a little bit, right? And taking a little bit of a hit. Uh, hopefully, you're enjoying what you're studying. So the way the greedy algorithm works is that every moment, 
let's do what's best. So I'm gonna take the largest Fibonacci number, less than or equal to 51, which would be 34, and I subtract that, and then I'm left with 34 plus 17, and I've put 34 in red up there to show that I'm now using that in my decomposition. Well, then I look at the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to 17, that's going to be 13. It's going to be 13. And so I subtract off 13, and then I'll get 34 plus 13 plus four. The largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to four is going to be three. So I'll get three plus one, and I'm all done. And so this is the decomposition of 51. And so what's interesting is there is a freak occurrence with normalizations in the world that allows you to do the following. If I shift all the Fibonacci indices by one, so 34 becomes 55, 13 becomes 21, and I look at the shifted sum, 51 becomes 83. 51 is approximately 82.1 kilometers. So if you want to convert from miles to kilometers or vice versa, you write the number in its second of decomposition, shift. Why does this work? Yes. Meters excellent, time. excellent. So the golden mean, which is the ratio and the limit of adjacent Fibonacci numbers, is approximately the conversion factor between miles and kilometers. And so this is a great way. Now, if you wanted to convert a number like four, it would actually not do a good job. How could you do a better job converting four? No. Good, multiply four by a thousand, right? Convert four thousand. And then that will do a great job. Okay, so the first result is the central limit type theorem. So if you look at the distribution of the number of summons in the Zeckendorf decomposition, it converges to a Gaussian. And so one of the big things you have to be very careful about whenever you do something is that you compare apples to apples. If I'm looking at numbers from you know, one to 25 quadrillion, I would expect numbers near 25 quadrillion to have a lot more summons than numbers near one. If I assume my numbers live between the nth and n plus first Fibonacci number, they all have to have fn as a sum, and I've kind of normalized this. And so this will give me um, you know, Gaussian behavior. Uh, the next thing you can start to look at is the gaps between summons. And so what we can do is we can look at our indices, and we can look at the spacings between indices, and we can ask, how many times do we have a gap of length 1, a gap of length 2, a gap of length 3? And so I don't want to go into too much the notation up above, can anybody tell me how often we should have a gap of length zero or one between summons in the Zeckendorf decomposition? So the Zeckendorf is writing your number as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci's. So how often should you have two summons that are next to each other or the same? Never. So the first gap, the smallest gap you should see is a gap of length two. And here is a plot of the uh, probabilities of the different gap lengths. One of the big things in mathematics is how do you present information so you can see what's going on? And so does everybody see that this is a geometric random variable? What I've done here is I've plotted the ratios of consecutive probabilities. And you can see, oh, wow, those ratios all look to be about the golden mean until the very end, which is where we don't have as many data points. And there could be something very interesting happening as you go really deep down for large gaps. Another thing you can look at, and I love this, is the longest gap. How long do you have to wait before you see another summit? And, the, and you know, I don't want to go into too much detail. All I want to say here is, how many of you have ever had to differentiate a function like e to the e to the x? Where they give this to you as a make work problem in calculus to just make sure you know, you know chain rule and all that stuff. This is actually a situation where something like this occurs. When you're looking at longest gaps, you, know, you can also do this you know, flipping a coin what's the longest run of heads or something like that. This is something where a double exponential naturally occurs. So it's interesting to see where some of these functions arise. All right, so what I want to do is I want to give you a longer proof of Zeckendorf's theorem, okay? And you've got to be careful because this is being recorded. So I will face this as the cookie problem. So the number of ways of dividing C identical cookies among P distinct people is C plus P minus one choose P minus one. This is sometimes called the stars and bars problem. How many people have heard of this? Okay, a lot of people, so I'll do this somewhat quickly. So imagine we have the original classic cookie monster, the cookie monster who is always willing to eat cookies, who will not be singing about vegetables and stuff like that. Right? This is the good cookie monster. So imagine we put C plus P minus one cookies on a line. So for example, we could say maybe C equals eight and P equals five. So we put 
uh, eight plus four cookies on the line. Cookie Monster shows up. And because Cookie Monster is willing to help us, Cookie Monster will eat P minus one cookies. And so let's say he eats the third, fourth, seventh, and 11th cookie. And now what you can see is there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with the number of ways Cookie Monster can eat P minus one out of C plus P minus one cookies and the number of ways to divide C identical cookies among P people. Everything up to the first person, I'm sorry, up to the first eating cookie goes to the first person. Everything between the first and the second goes to the second person. It's not their day, they get no cookies. And so there's a really nice one-to-one -one correspondence. And so we can use this to count how many ways there are. This is equivalent to solving a Diophantine equation. I wanna solve x1 plus dot 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 plus xp equals c with each xi a non-negative integer. That's the same as just dividing up the cookies. Okay. And so we can use this to solve or to prove Zeckendorf's theorem as follows. Let's let pnk be the number of integers between the nth and n plus first Fibonacci number that have exactly k summits. So I'm gonna prove more than Zeckendorf's theorem. I'm gonna prove how many times we actually have k summits. And then I'll sum over all possible numbers of k and I'll see that the number of integers I get is going to be fn minus one, which is how many numbers are in the interval. And so since every number has a unique number of summons, you can show that you can't have two different Zeckendorf decompositions. That proves every number has a Zeckendorf decomposition. Okay, so now what we do is we want to count how many ways are there to have exactly k summons. We have to have fn, otherwise we're not gonna be in that interval. We can't have fn minus one, we could have fn minus two and so on and so on and so on. So we have k summons, and so I'll write them down like this. And I label my indices, I1, I2, I3. I know the last index IK has to be N. I know the first one has to be at least one. And I know each gap has to be at least two. How many of you have ever given a public math talk? Okay, one of the rules is thou shalt not do algebra in public. <laughs> okay, so just trust me that the algebra works. And so what happens is let's let D1 be the distance from I1 to one, let's let dj be the distance from ij to ij minus one. We know d1 has to be at least zero. We know each one of these has to be at least two. So I'm gonna subtract off the two that I know it has to be. When you add up all of these, if you do the algebra correctly, you know, if you add up the gaps plus the ones you're doing, you get n minus two k plus one. Just trust me on the algebra of, I'm just adding up all the gaps in the spots where I am. And when you put that together, then we've just shown that the number of times you have exactly k cookies is well, I'm just dividing this many cookies among k people. So it's this number of cookies plus k minus one choose k minus one. And when you do the algebra, it's n minus k choose k minus one. And so I now have a formula for how many times I have exactly k cookies. And then you just sum this over all k and it turns out it equals fn minus one. It's a nice binomial coefficient identity that this sums to fn minus one. It's not immediately clear that that will happen. Okay, so this proves the Zeckendorf theorem. There's a lot you can do from this. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here because I wanna make sure I get to the Zeckendorf game. And so I'll just give you a quick sketch of the Gaussianity. And so I proved this with a couple of students at Williams uh, in my second, I guess in the, summer of, in the summer after my first or second year. And so we showed that as n goes to infinity, it converges to a Gaussian. I gave a talk on the theorem before the summer program began. And so I went to a conference in New York City and I said, my students will be proving the following theorem. It will follow immediately from Stirling's formula and some algebra. We haven't proved it yet. Please, nobody work on this. Mm -hmm. I wanna see how far they can push this, but this is what they're going to prove. And so I knew the students would get it after just doing some algebra because we have an explicit formula for how many times you know, we have exactly k summons. We know how many numbers. To just make things a little bit easier, I shift the index down by one, it makes the algebra a little bit nicer. And then you just go through some pages of algebra. Or better yet, your students go through some pages of algebra. And after they go through some pages of algebra, they go through more pages of algebra. And after more pages of algebra comes even more pages of algebra. Taking lots of logarithms, expanding things, keeping the main terms, throwing away the lower order terms, just doing careful book. It's just all follow your nose mathematics. As soon as you start doing this, it's not so bad. At least if you're the professor. Mm -hmm. The students keep working, multiple, multiple mistakes. It, it took you know, a couple of days before your things finally finished, but this wasn't that day. And so we had to keep going a little bit further. And then eventually the dust settled and we ended up getting the Gaussian. And then the question was, can we prove it's a Gaussian in other settings? 
a lot of times you're looking at the wrong problem. We should not have been looking at the Fibonacci's. I love the Fibonacci's. I'm the president-elect of the society. If you have any issues with the Fibonacci numbers, please let me know. I will do my best to fix them. It's a wonderful sequence, but it's not the sequence we should have looked at. So what we're really doing is we're looking at a recurrence relation. Your HN plus one can be expressed as a fixed linear combination with integer coefficients. It turns out we want non-negative integer coefficients. And your second dwarf is every positive integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent. There's a generalization with this. And roughly the generalization says is don't be an idiot and have a string that you could reduce using the recurrence law. That's the informal phrasing. Um, then there's also a central limit theorem. There's formulas for the mean number of summons and everything like that. Uh, the formula gets a little bit worse in general um, in terms of what's going on. And it's really nice to have students to handle the generalizations. Um, what I want to just do is do this quick case in base 10. Why do we like to work base 10? If you know the answer, please raise your hands. Yes, exactly, right? So why do we like base 10? We have 10 figures. There's nothing special about base 10. We could do base two and be computers. We could do base 16, whatever. So let's look at what would happen in base 10. So HN plus one is 10 times HN. So each number is 10 times the previous. What does it mean to be a legal decomposition? Well, it's just writing something in decimal. So if you look at how many summons do you have, if I have the number 2,024, I have two one thousands, I have no hundreds, I have two tens, I have four ones. So if my number was 2,024, the number of summons would be eight. And so if you look at it, if I wanna know how many summons, I just add the digits. Well, if you look at it, all the digits are equally likely to be anything from zero to nine, except the leading digit. What must be true about the leading digit? Yes? Where does the leading li digit live? All the other digits live from zero to nine. The le leading digit lives from one to nine. Well, if I have a huge number of digits, the fact that the first digit has to be restricted ever so slightly is not gonna really change anything. And so now Gauss unity comes from the central limit there. You know, the sum of independent identically distributed random variables will converge to a Gaussian. So in the case of your know, base 10, it's actually not that bad to see what's going on. Okay. Um, I think we have time to do gaps in the bulk and then do the second graph phase. So just quickly do gaps in the bulk to give you an example of the power of the perspective of looking at Zeckendorf's theorem by the cookie problem. So if I give you some kind of decomposition, for example, say F1 plus F8 plus F18, the gaps are seven between the first two indices and 10 between the next. And what I can do is I can ask, what is the probability, you know, assuming it exists as n goes to infinity, that I have a gap of length k. So if I give you a specific decomposition, it could have lots of gaps of length k. And I have to look at all possible integers between fn and fn plus one. So the simplest way to do this is I take a giant bucket and I put all the gaps in. And then I take out all the gaps of length two, then I take out all the gaps of length three, then I take out the gaps of all length four. The harder problem is take a specific number and look at its decomposition. And for that specific number, ask how many times does it have a gap of length two? So what you can show is for almost all numbers, it's a lot more work, it's gap distribution approaches the geometric. It's much easier to do extra averaging. The more averaging you do in mathematics, the easier the problem is. You can do it for specific numbers, but it's just a little bit more work. And so I'll show you very quickly that if you average over all numbers, you get geometric decay. And so uh, my students were able to prove a formula for essentially geometric decay as long as your recurrence relation has all the CIs greater than or equal to one. So as long as you don't have any zeros, we were able to prove that you have geometric decay once the gap is at least two. We could probably do something if we had um, zeros, but then the algebra becomes a lot more painful and nobody was excited enough to do it. We're not seeing new behavior, so we really weren't that excited. But you know, it's definitely something that could be circled back to. I've got lots of problems related to this that are very accessible. You should hopefully see how accessible things are in a moment. All right, so let's quickly show the, the gaps become geometric decay. So you can count how many gaps there are on average. So if I'm looking between Fn and Fn plus one, the average number has N over phi squared plus one gaps, where phi is the golden mean. I have Fn minus one numbers between Fn and Fn plus one. So the total number of gaps is just the number of numbers times the average number of gaps or summons. So now we have to be careful with our counting. 
xij is going to be the number of integers whose decomposition includes fi and fj, but nothing in between. So that will be a gap of length j minus i starting at i and ending j. So if I want to count how many gaps there are, to specify a gap, I need to know where does it start and what its length. And this will avoid all double counting. And so if I want to calculate gaps of length k, I look at all starting points, i goes from 1 to n minus k, and I count how many are there from i to i plus k, and then I divide by the total number. And so now all I have to do is count how many uh, decompositions include fi and fi plus k and nothing else in between. So using high-tech imagery, I have a black dot for fi, a black dot for fi plus k, oh no, and a black dot for fn because I have to have those. I've xed out all the ones I know I don't have. Well, if you look at what's going on in the beginning, I have to have fi, I don't have to have, I can't have fi minus one. It's the same as asking how many legal decompositions are there with the summons from f1, f2, all the way up to fi minus one. I mean, all the way up to fi where you have fi. That's just counting all the legal decompositions of numbers between fi and fi plus one. There's fi minus one of these. And similarly for the second one, it's the same. We know we don't have fi plus k plus one. It's the same as if we're starting two after that. So when you shift the indices down, it's just a second door problem again. We just multiply the two. And when you multiply the two, you get the product of two Fibonacci numbers. And so the total number of times where we have a gap of length k starting at i is equal to this product. We know how to handle the product. If you know Binet's formula, we know that the Fibonacci number is approximately one over root five golden mean to a power. The index depends on how you define the Fibonacci's. We can evaluate the sum. And when the dust settles, it becomes a beautiful one over golden mean to the k. And this is a nice benefit of taking a new perspective. When I first uh, heard this result um, about some of these decompositions, it was being given by a colleague of mine who's a number theorist and the proofs were using continued fractions. And I should have been excited because I'm a number theorist, I like continued fractions. But I'm listening to the talk and go, no, this is not a talk on continued fractions. This is a talk on combinatorics. And you should recast this in terms of combinatorics. Now, unfortunately, you know, I wanted to just quickly write down notes. The only piece of paper I had on me was my son was in daycare and he'd been bitten by one of his good friends. And so I had an after action report. And so you know, on the back of that in whatever space I could find, I'm quickly you know, sketching the calculations as to how to recast the problem. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can completely bypass all the continued fractions and do this by combinatorics. And so it opened up a whole line of research, which a bunch of students have worked on with me for you know, over a decade now, because we have a new way of looking at these problems. We're applying different techniques and tools. All right. So what I want to end with is the Zeckendorf game. And so we have, I think, about 14 minutes. So if you are able to come up with a winning strategy, I will pay you $500. If that's not enough money, I will pay you $1,000. If that's not enough money, then we need to talk. <laughs> but you, know, you can give me up to $1,000 without any trouble. I want a constructive winning strategy, okay? And this is being recorded. The papers are online. You're, you're welcome to continue working on this later. So it's a two-player game. Whoever moves last wins. And the way the work the game works in the following. We have a bunch of bins, F1, F2, F3. Each bin represents a Fibonacci number, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, et cetera. And we put N pieces on F1. And the way it works is on your turn, if you have two pieces on FK, you can remove them and put one piece on FK plus one and one piece on FK minus two. So if you think about it, if you have two eights, two eights adds up to 16, that's the same as 13 plus three. If you have two 21s, that adds up to 42, and you can write that as 34 plus eight. You have to be a little bit careful at the end. And so you know, if I have two of them on F1, it becomes one F2 and nothing. So you've got to be a little bit careful at the edge. Uh, some of my students, including a uh, recent Yale graduate, uh, Ethan Pesikoff, played some modifications of this to try to fix the game. You could actually go off to negative indices and not worry about this you know, issue down here. And then the other possibility is if I have pieces at FK and FK plus one, I can replace them and put one at FK plus two. So if I have an eight and a 13, I can replace them and get a 21. And so you keep playing as long as there's a legal move. So if you have a double, you can split. If you have two adjacents, you can combine and move down one. And so the questions are natural. 
you know, does the game end? If so, how long will it take for each end? Who has the winning strategy? And so I'm going to just go through a you know, fixed game right now. I'm not going to play optimally. So let's say we start off with 10 pieces on the one bin. So it's 10. There's really only one possible opening move. I have to take two on the 10 and put one on the two. So I now have eight on the one and one on the two. And if you notice, eight times one plus one times two still adds up to 10. I now have two possible moves. I could take a one and a two and make a three, or I could take two ones and make a two. Let's say I take two ones and make a two. And so now I'll have six on the one, two on the two. Now I have several possible moves. I could take two on the two and split to a three and a one. I could take two on the one and make it a two. I could take a one and a two and make a three. Let's split the two ones on the two. Okay, I'm gonna do just one more. Uh, now I have only one possible move. I have to take the two ones and make them a two. Right, so, that, so I'll do one more after that because that one was boring. And so now I have a couple of possibilities. Let's take the one on the two and the one on the three and put one on the four. So does everybody get a sense of how the game is played? And so you can keep going and you eventually, you know, here is the end of a game and player one wins in nine moves. Does anything look interesting about this table? Yes. So you end in the second of decomposition. Excellent observation. Do you think that's a coincidence? No. So the game will always end in the second of decomposition. If you're not in the second of decomposition, then that means you have to have something doubled or two things adjacent so you can keep playing. So it's clear that if you're not in the second of decomposition, the game can't end. What's not as clear is that you will always end up in the second of decomposition. We might prove that in a few moments. There's also a blank space over here. And the reason is in this one, the person took a one and a two and made a three. Instead of doing that, you could take the two and you could split that. And if you do that instead, you would then have two in the one and none here. And that adds one more row. And so what that tells you is sometimes player one can win, sometimes player two can win. So depending on how the game is played, you can have different winners. And so it turns out every game is going to end in finitely many moves. And it's actually not too bad to prove this. The proof uses a monovariant. How many of you have ever heard of monovariants? Right, education is better here than when I was. I don't think I had heard of monovariance when I was an undergrad. Um, a monovariant is a quantity that can only change in one direction. Can somebody give me a monovariant about yourself that you're willing to share in public? Age. Age. Can you give me? Okay. Can you give me something about yourself that's not a monovariant? Weight, right? And if you get old, there's something else about you that's not a monovariant. Height, yeah, unfortunately, height is not a monovariant. I haven't hit that inflection point yet, but that's coming. So there's a couple of monovariants we can associate. Uh, initially, I did this with the monovariant was the sum of the indices. It's actually easier to use the sum of the square roots of the indices. And again, thou shalt not do algebra in public, okay? So what you can do is you can show if you add two consecutive terms, I go from a root k, root k, um, Oh, wait, should that be root k and root k plus one? Yeah, it should be root k, that's right, but should be root k plus root k plus one minus root k plus two is clearly going to be less than zero. If I split, you know, two root k, yeah, so, so there's, there's multiple typos on this slide, okay. That's why you don't do that. Right, this should, this, this should be a k minus two. And so you just go through and you show the algebras, and then you have to be a little bit careful for the very extreme conditions. But you just show that every time you make a move, the sum of the square roots of the indices decreases. Well, if I give you any finite number, I know I can't use anything larger than the nth Fibonacci number in the decomposition of n. So there's only, yes. Um, yeah, so I'm going to say there's a, there's a bunch of typos on the slides. Um, I, I think these should all be positive. I think they're, they're all going in the wrong direction. The, 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 the first one should be a greater than sign, right? So kudos for you for pointing this out, but you should have pointed out the mistake earlier. That is easy to, yes. No, what's, what's interesting is how many years I've given this talk and this is the first time this has been pointed out, uh, which is... <laughs> yes, exactly, yes. They should all be reversed, yes. Oh, oh wait a minute. How are you defining um, the less than symbol? <laughs> 
Yes. The, the alligator. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I always said it was going away from the logic number. Oh, yes. So yeah, so you, you, you should flip all these, fix the typos, yes. So there's only finitely many possible second of decompositions if you have at most n of each number up to n. So there's at most, you know, n times n is n squared possible numbers. So every time we do a move, it lowers the sum. Since there's only finitely many possibilities, eventually we can't get any lower. And so eventually we have to end up with the second of decomposition. So that's the proof. All right, so you can have upper bounds. It is still an open question as to whether or not if you play the game randomly, you get a Gaussian. What we have been able to prove is that half the time it takes an even number of moves and half the time it takes an odd number of moves. We can't quite get Gaussianity. That is the closest we've been able to get. And so what I want to do now, I've got six minutes left, is I want to prove to you that player two has a winning strategy. So we mentioned that something big is happening in 2024. I've done a lot of math consulting. Do you think it would be valuable if I went to a presidential candidate and say, I have a proof that you can win the White House in 2024? <laughs> Do you think that would be valuable? What would be the first question I would be asked? So I'm a theoretical mathematician. It's an existence proof. <laughs> so this is a non-constructive proof, unfortunately. So we can prove that player two has a winning strategy without being able to construct it. And so the idea is that if player one had a winning strategy, player two could steal it. So I want to show you uh, this. So how many of you have ever played the game Chomp? All right, so the way Chomp works is you have a grid, your know, N by M of dots. And on your turn, you choose a dot and you everything from that dot up and to the right. So should it be whoever eats the last dot wins or loses? Loses. Because if it's whoever eats the last dot wins, what would you do on your first turn? Yeah, you just eat the bottom left and you'd be done. So whoever eats the last dot loses. So I'm going to prove to you that player one has a winning strategy. So if we're at a board configuration where player one has the winning strategy, player one just plays it. If not, that means player two has a winning strategy. So that means no matter where player one goes, player two has a winning move after that to keep them on a path to victory. So let's say player one goes in the upper right square, and now it's player two's turn. For definiteness, let's say their winning strategy is to go here, and they now have all of these dots. Player one now goes the, that's not what I meant to do. I'm taking over, take over, take over, take over. I wanted to go where you went. That's my turn. I'm taking, that's my move now and you can't stop me. Okay. And so now player one has gone there. We're now at the same configuration we were a moment ago, but we've now switched whose turn it was. And so if player two had the winning strategy, player one has just stolen it. Unfortunately, we don't know what the winning strategy is, but we know player one has a winning strategy. The Zeckendorf game is very similar. So I gave this as a thesis project to one of my students. Um, you know, she solved the thesis problem and she did prove that player two has the winning strategy. Unfortunately, she did not give me the strategy to beat my daughter. Mm -hmm. She just told me player two can win. She didn't tell me how. So the notation means one N minus seven, wedge two, wedge five means I have N minus seven ones, I have one two, I have one five. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna start off player one, starts off and we'll assume player one has the winning strategy. So I will color this peach orange. I don't know. Now, player two has only one possible move. So player two, I'm sorry, player one moves down to here. That's the only possible move for player one. We're assuming player one has the winning strategy. So we still color that peach. We'll color things blue if player two has the winning strategy. Now player two has two different moves. Since we're assuming player one has a winning strategy, no matter what player two chooses, player one can still play for the win. So let's say for definiteness, um, we'll, we'll call both of these peach. Uh, for definiteness, let's explore one of them. Let's explore what happens. So player two, one move to here, player two move to here. Let's explore what goes on to here. Okay, I know that has to be a win for player one, because if player two put me over here, that's the only move player one has. So I have to color this pink. So no matter where player two goes, it's got to still be a winning move for player one. So player two moves us to one of these. And now it's player one's turn. And now imagine we move to here. But it's the same configuration as that, but it's one level deeper. And so if player one had the winning strategy from there, it then changes things. And so again, I may have misspoken ever so slightly, but the idea is you can trace the tree back 
and player two can somehow steal the game if necessary. And so player two has the winning strategy and they can just keep pushing it back. You can generalize this. You can say, what if you had multiple people playing the game at the same time? What can you do in a situation like that? And you know, what if there were alliances? What if players one, three, what if the odds are playing against the events? You know, can you come up with ways for certain configurations of winning strategies? What if you play with something other than the Fibonacci numbers? We have some versions of the game where we're pretty sure the game terminates, but we can't prove it. And so there's a lot of open questions for stuff like this. What I love about these projects is they're not as of great interest to in the number theory community as the projects I do on zeros of L functions and Riemann zeta functions, stuff like that. But these are often harder. They require you to be far more creative. Difficulty is figuring out what you want to study, what you want to investigate. So I mentioned earlier that anybody who comes today is guaranteed to get into a summer program. I'm trying to just get to the slide. Yes. So you can also email me. It's the Polymath Junior RU program. So I serve on a regional school committee. And in January of 2020, there were some rumblings about this thing called COVID-19. And I asked my colleagues on the school committee, you know, should we have a plan B just in case this is worse than everybody's saying, oh, no, 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 it's not going to be that bad. So I talked to the different directors of the math summer research programs. They're like, yeah, you're right. We should have a plan B. And so we created the Polymath Junior Online Program. So we have never rejected anybody who has taken a theoretical math course. So anybody, is, has everybody here taken at least linear algebra? Or, or at least calculus BC? Okay. So anybody who is here, I will guarantee that you get into the Polymath Program. So it is guaranteed to have something to do mathematical research over the summer. You can do this while doing something else. If you get into a real in-person program, you should do that instead. But the polymath program is a great way to do math research with people all over the world. There's unfortunately no stipend, there's no direct interactions with people, but it gives you something. And we've had a lot of people do a polymath program and then go from that to grad school or go from that to an in-person program the next year. The goal is to try to find accessible projects that have parts that can be split off so that different people have a sense of ownership. And so a lot of the results, which I didn't get a chance to talk to today, were actually done by students in the polymath program. So thank you.